experiment is simple, to sit in front of a mirror and watch my face for three hours. It's a variation on an observation experiment I came across in The Power of Patience, an essay by the, uh, about the pedagogical, um, pedagogical benefits of immersive attention by Jennifer L. Roberts, a professor of art history and architecture at Harvard. In her essay, Professor Roberts describes an assignment she gives her students each year to go to a museum or gallery and spend three full hours observing a single work of art and making a detailed record of the observations, uh, of the observations questions, and speculations that arise over that time. The three-hour assignment, she admits, is designed to feel excessively long. Painfully is the word that she uses, <laughs> asserting that anything less painful will not yield the benefits of the immersive attention that she seeks to teach. Paintings are time batteries, she writes, quoting art historian Joseph, uh, David jo uh, Jocelyn. They are, quote, exorbitant stockpiles of temporal experience and information that can only be tapped and unpacked using the skills of slow processing and strategic patience, skills that our impatient world has caused to atrophy. She's trying to help her students develop their stunted skill set so they will learn not simply to look at art, but to see it. My face is not a work of art. There's no reason for me to look at it other than to make sure that there's no spinach stuck between my teeth. <laughs> I rarely put on makeup. My hair seems to take care of itself, more or less. But after reading Robert's article, it seemed to me that a face, uh, that a face is a time battery, too, a stockpile of experience. And I began to wonder what my 59-year-old face might reveal if I could bear to look at it for three hours a painfully long time indeed. My relationship with my reflection has changed over the years. As a young child, I was indifferent to my reflected self. As I grew a bit older, I turned shy and avoided my reflection. But by the time I was a teenager, I was spending lavish amounts of time in front of mirrors, scrutinizing every follicle and pore, and developing a minute and almost mi microscopic relationship with my surfaces. I don't think I was different from most American teenagers in this way. The, the compulsive self-regard continued into the early years of my adulthood and then diminished as I aged. Now, although I still check my reflection in shop windows and glance at my face when I'm washing my hands or brushing my teeth, I spend very little time in front of mirrors. And yet, over a lifetime, it adds up to, what, hundreds of hours? Days, weeks, or months even? Three more hours should be doable, but I'm loath to start. Why? Is it vanity? Anti-vanity? How would I know? What does 59-year-old vanity look like, anyway? 59 is a difficult age for a face. <coughs> Menopause wreaks havoc with a face's sense of self, and the changes are rapid and cascading. It's like puberty in reverse. At 59, I never quite know what my face will be when I wake up in the morning. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? So mutters the aging queen. Our tales all tell us that an old woman's vanity is, at best, sad and unseemly, and at worst, ridiculous and even evil. As I approach my 60th year, I feel I should be moving away from the question, am I still fair, towards a more existential question, am I still here? <laughs> You'd think seeing myself in a mirror would be some somewhat reassuring. And yet, recently, I've noticed that when I catch sight of my face in a shop window, I'm quick to look away. When I brush my teeth, I'll often turn my back to the mirror or focus on a detail of my reflection, a blemish or a spot, rather than on my aspect as a whole. It's not that I don't like what I see, although that's often part of it. Rather, it's more that I don't quite recognize myself in my reflection anymore, and so I'm always startled. Averting my gaze is a reflect, reflexive reaction, a kind of uncanny valley response to the sight of this person who is no longer quite me. It's not polite to stare at strangers. In Zen teachings, impermanence is the first of the three marks of existence. Everything changes, nothing stays the same. The second mark of existence is no self, which derives from the first. If everything changes and nothing stays the same, then there's no such thing as a fixed self. The self is only a passing notion, a changing story relative to its momentary position in space and time. Suffering, the third mark of existence, derives quite logically from the first two. 
We don't like impermanence. We want to be someone, a fixed self, and we want that self to last. Lacking this fixity, we suffer. When teaching the three marks of existence, the Buddha assigned his students an observation exercise similar to Professor Roberts. He sent his disciples to meditate not in an art gallery, but in a charnel ground, instructing them to observe corpses in their various stages of decomposition. One, two, or three days dead, bloated, living, uh, livid, and oozing matter, being devoured by crows, hawks, vultures, dogs, jackals, or various kinds of worms, a skeleton with flesh and blood held together with sinews, a fleshless skeleton smeared with blood held together with sinews, a skeleton without flesh and blood held together with sinews, disconnected bones scattered in all directions, bones bleached white the color of shells, bones heaped up more than a year old, bones rotten and crumbling to dust. You get the picture. Buddha's strategy was to force his students to confront what scares and disgusts them so that they could really, so that they could see reality at work and thereby understand the truth of the three marks of existence. This dose of reality, he hoped, would liberate them from the suffering caused by their delusory attachment to what is not fixed, permanent, or real. My face is not a work of art, but neither is it ready for the charnel ground yet. Meditating upon it for three hours, however painful, is not quite equivalent to what the Buddha suggests, but then again, my goals are more modest. I'm not looking for liberation or enlightenment. I'm just trying to write this essay about my face, and making a time log seems like a good place to start. And since it is a meditative exercise, I decide to conduct the experiment in front of the small Buddhist altar where I meditate every day. I sit down on my cushion and look at the mirror where the statue of Buddha should be, feeling stupid and vaguely transgressive. Buddhism is a non-theistic religion. There's nothing inherently holy about a statue of Buddha. Buddha is not a god. Buddhism teaches that we are all Buddhas because we all have Buddha nature. This being so, replacing the Buddha with a mirror and gazing into it should theoretically be fine, a bit literal perhaps, but doctrinally not a problem. So why do I feel so uncomfortable, like I'm committing an act of Zen sacrilege? Time code, zero hours, 10 minutes, 12 seconds. Staring at my face, I'm aware that I want to touch it. Touch the scar on my forehead, the pimple on my chin, rub my nose, my eyes, scratch my cheek. I'm aware that everything looks wrong, my face, my hair, my collar, and I want to fix things. I run my fingers through my hair, pulling it back from my face. It falls forward again like a curtain. It's trying to shield me from myself. Nice. I've spent much of my life hiding behind this curtain of hair. 13 minutes, two seconds. When I look myself in the eye, it's hard to look away. Eyes define a face. If we were not such visual creatures, if we received our sensory input some other way, maybe we would not need faces. Trees do not need faces. Jellyfish do not need faces. Daisies do, and they don't have eyes, so perhaps I'm wrong about this. 14 minutes, 37 seconds still watching the eyes, sad, serious, brown, slanting downward. The angle of the slope seems more pronounced, more acute than I'd realized. Have my eyes changed? My eyelids are heavier. The folds of skin almost meet the lashes. The right eye and left eye are very different. The left eye looks slightly more Asiatic. The right epicanthic fold is more pronounced, making that eye look more Caucasian. I used to notice this when I put on eyeliner, but there's something I've never noticed before, or at least never admitted. I have a preference. It's subtle, but I've always preferred my right eye to my left. I've preferred my Caucasian eye to my Asian eye. Strange. Optical orientation. When I was growing up, we all knew that Orientals had slanty eyes. We knew that Chinese eyes slanted upwards and Japanese eyes slanted downwards. In school, we used to play a game about this. Putting our fingers in the outside corners of our eyes, we'd push them up and sing Chinese. Then we'd pull them down and sing Japanese. And then, pushing one corner up and pulling the other down, canting our eyes in different directions and making them wonky, we'd holler half and half. I hollered louder than anyone because I was the punchline. Everyone knew it, and this made me feel special, a little uneasy and a little bit proud. Nothing about the joke or the punchline was true, of course. 
Chinese eyes did not go up, Japanese eyes did not go down, my eyes did not go in opposite directions, and I wasn't half Chinese. My father was Caucasian American of Anglo-Saxon and Northern European descent. My mother was ethnically Japanese and had been a Japanese citizen, although by the time I was born, she'd become a naturalized American. On my birth certificate, my father's race is recorded as white and my mother's race as yellow. I grew up thinking, my, thinking of myself as half Japanese, although the word half used to confuse me. Half of what? Which half was which? And how was I divided? Was Japanese the top half or the bottom? Or did the dividing line run diagonally? Once, when I was about 10 or 11, some boys accosted me in the park and asked me if I had a slanty Jap vagina. That confused me, too. I'd never heard the word vagina spoken out loud before. Growing up in Connecticut, I'd never thought of myself as half white or half American. White American was the default, so that half never needed to be articulated. White American was not comical or joke-worthy, and there was no need to point fingers at it. As kids, were we aware of the underlying racism of our games? I think not, or not entirely. We just thought it was funny to distort our faces into caricature, squishing our cheeks and crossing our eyes, making Asian buck teeth, Negro lips, and piggy noses. Our faces were young and pliable, and we stretched and twisted our features like silly putty, testing the grotesque plasticity of self. We laughed. We were hilarious. Nobody stopped us. Words like Chinese and Japanese were part of the post-war lexicon, and somehow we knew that they were meant to be comical, while other words like chink, jap, nip, or nigger were not. But even though we may not have been fully conscious of the racism of our games, we did understand that racial stereotyping was titillating and a little bit taboo. And as a half, my understanding went deeper. In some pre-conscious and inchoate way, I felt the precarious instability that comes with the mixing of the blood. I understood that identity is fluid, that it exists on a spectrum, and that, to some extent, I had a choice about where I fell. So when the kids contorted their faces, although I felt uneasy at being identified with the wonky half-and-half -half face, I suspect I also felt relieved and even grateful that as a diluted white person, the peril I represented was only half of what it might be. And so, in order to align myself further with the hegemony and to keep the real bad words at bay, I raised my voice and joined the chorus, pulling my eyes out of shape and singing out Chinese, Japanese. The trick, I learned, was to appropriate the punchline. Here was another game we played. When the first snow dusted the ground, my best friend Jane and I would get long sticks and go out into the street and use the sticks to draw faces. I would draw Japanese faces, and Jane would draw American faces. The game we, play, the game we were playing was World War II, and these faces were our troops. The person with the most troops would win the war. We'd draw our faces in the same way, with a big circle for the head, dots for the nose, and a line for the mouth. Only the eyes were different. Mine were just two slants, slashed quickly in the snow, but Jane had to draw whole little circles for eyes, which took her a lot longer, and since it was a race, she always lost. <laughs> We'd play until dusk, and the entire street was filled with faces, and my Japan had won. It never occurred to us that we were rewriting history. <laughs>